Uh, welcome. We're, this is our February midwinter study. It's on our activity for the midwinter. Give us a little bit something extra to do. Um, Mars was thinking today, oh, gee, this weather is getting warm. Um, no, this is, the, this is the February fake thawing. Happens every year. Sometimes it gets right down to where it starts to melt, and and then we go a little bit later in February, and it it's really cold. So that's right, back to the minus twenties and thirties. So yeah, the minus thirties. Yeah, now's your chance. Repair any water damage that you have, any pipes. Done. Done. Um, you know, do anything like that. Um, so I'm just going to open with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into Revelation. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the ability to be together, uh, both here at the church and online, and for those that are watching. And we just, we want to honor you. We want to not only just spend time learning about um, Revelation, but how to engage with you in your Bible. And then as we do that, you'll help us to share it with others. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Amen. So this is a, not like a, a discovering God study this is more of like a classroom type setting that's why i say everyone's got to raise your hand if you have a question so but there's two parts to this class one is we're learning how to read the bible so all throughout this i'm going to be giving tools to help us learn how to read the bible and as well uh, another thing that we're going to be doing is studying the book of revelation but it's only seven weeks it's only an overview we're just going to see what we can see so I'm just going to refer to my notes here and there because I underline stuff that's important. Um, as we're reading by um, God's word, we should really be wanting to know the author. That's the most important thing as we're doing God's word. Know the author. That's what we're aiming for. And not only just know him so we can be changed to be like him. That's what we're doing tonight. And with every time we read the Bible. So we should be moved to action when we're reading the bible so we can be more like our lord and that's what we're doing but it's also important to remember that when we're reading a letter we're reading somebody else's mail this is somebody else's letter every single one of the books of the bible is written slightly different and for a different purpose so it's good for us to know who it is and why was it written um, it's very important especially uh, Revelation may be more so than most other books. We need to know what it meant to the original audience. It's uh, most, there's a lot of Christian scholars right now. Uh, there's a lot of books in the bookstore about Revelation, and they're looking at it in trying to interpret the events of Revelation from our point of view. And we can get messed up and we could start thinking all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, for example, some of the people that were involved in the first Reformation era they thought well obviously the antichrist and the, the the beast and all these things are referring to rome so that must be the roman catholic church that's what they all believed and we look at it now people go no no it means this or it means that and then somehow russia always gets involved unless you're russian then the united states gets involved um so we're not doing that but just going back to that first tool read the book of the bible Look who the author is and who the intended audience is. And I just wanted to read my conversation. For those that didn't read the notes, I have a conversation for an example. Imagine if I was writing a letter to someone else sharing about my baseball game that I had last week. And this is how I'm just going to point out the parts of the letter where I came to bat. When the first time I was at bat, I hit a can of corn to the left field. My second time up, I crushed a slider that cleared the fence, but it was foul. Then I struck it. My third time up, I was facing a different pitcher. I was able to work the count full and was hit by the next pitch and took my base. At my final at bat, I hit a laser to the right field seats, driving in three runs to win the game on a walk off. Now, if you're not familiar with baseball terms, you're thinking, well, the first sentence must have to do with agriculture. It mentions a, a field and a can of corn. Uh, you could think that the second one seems to involve violent actions and some adversity before going on, an, on a journey. Remember, that's where I, I crushed the slider, but it was foul, and foul is smelly. Right? 
A slider is a type of pitch or the person sliding into second base. So if I crush the slider, you think how that could look? It could look really bad if I said, I crush the slider and you don't know that it's a pitch. It's also a hamburger. <laughs> so you could crush a little tiny hamburger too. Um, the third time I'm, you know, I'm up, I'm facing a different pitcher. It's like, well, what does that talk about? Is it, is there new water? Is it now Gatorade? What is it? Um, and able to work the count full. Well, who's the count? It's not talking about who the count is. It's so we see how that could really, and, and the same thing happens when we, we do that in the Bible. We're not sure of what we're, we're reading about. Even the phrase at bat, what does that mean? You've never seen a baseball game. You don't know what at bat means. And so we're going to try and as we go through Revelation, we're get, there's a few spots we're going to take it slow, and there's a few spots we're going to go pretty quick. So um, other tools that we're going to look at is whenever we're reading a book of the Bible on our own or here, we want to know where is it? Is it in the Old Covenant? Because the Old Covenant is dealing mostly with Jewish people. Is it in the Gospels? when Jesus is presenting the new covenant or is it something that is part of the new Testament in the new covenant that we can just, this is written and we can almost walk right into it because there's different applications as we see it. There's some things that disciples didn't understand because they hadn't experienced the new covenant yet. They haven't experienced the, the Holy spirit on the inside. So they're going, wow, this is, I don't know what you're talking about Jesus, but then, Six months after Jesus is gone, they're the ones teaching, saying, this is totally makes sense now, doesn't it? And so it's important that we know that. It's also important to remember the Bible's not written in English. The New Testament is written in something I've, I've, uh, I have some, some pastor friends that disciple me, and they're like, yeah, it's, in, it's something called Koine Greek, the specific type of Greek. It's older Greek. They don't still speak Koine Greek. Um, a, a term that you'd hear in churches a lot at, at a time was koinonia, which is a time of fellowship together amongst the believers. Uh, so that's what it's written in. I also list in the notes uh, some great tools. Um, blueletterbible.org is a great tool. So what I use that one, it has a little spot that says type in here. So I can type any verse that I want, and then it lists all kinds of tools. If I click on tools, one of the tools is it will show me the Greek let words, all the Greek words in the sentence. They don't have commas. They don't have exclamation points. They have all the Greek words. And really, they're referring to this. This is a Strong's Concordance. So this lists every word in the Bible, both Hebrew and Greek. And they put numerical order to it. So there's all these numbers on it. So if I want to look up the Hebrew word for novice, I found out what it is. Oh, no, wait, there is no Hebrew word for novice. It's only Greek in the Bible. So there you go. You'll find it. Song. P.S. Well, let's look it up. Deb asked, what about the word song? I'm in P. P.R. PR. I know I'm almost on PS. There is. Well, princes, priests, promises, promised land, prophecy. Yep. Propitiation. That's a big one, Gabe. Good for you. Psalms. So it says here that's in the Hebrew word um, 2167. So I turn over to the Hebrew side and I look up the number. Where are we? 8 H2167. It can be a fun rabbit trail. And you can find out, wow, this word and Blue Letter Bible, it'll tell me how many times this word is used in the whole Bible. And I can reference books really fast, so I don't have to have this big thing on my lap. Right? So I could have looked it up three times over by now. What did I say it was? 26. 
2167. Even tells you how to pronounce the words. That's fun. So the word is zamar. That's the Hebrew because the psalm is a Hebrew word. So I'm probably saying it really bad. So it means to play upon, like a musical instrument. So the psalm is a musical poem. That's right. Lyrics is like the same thing. Lyrics are a song that you can, it's a poem that you can have song. And it's in Hebrew. Same as you can use this. This is a Vines dictionary of the Old Testament and New Testament. Same thing, except this one doesn't break it down as to this is how many times pardon it's also well, it's a dictionary so it's not a concordance will tell you the difference between a dictionary and a concordance so it's a good point dad a dictionary will tell you the meaning of a word a concordance will tell you where to find it in the bible most of our bibles at the back of a bible you'll find a concordance and so these are some of the tools we have remember the bible's not written in english that's the important part uh, and we'll stop every once in a while for a Greek word and, and go, this is a Greek word that is important. Like the word revelation. We're going to look up the Greek word for revelation for next. Uh, the third point that we're going to, um, to do is we want to see if there's any patterns to book. Just like when I write a letter, there's always a pattern. I would write, if I'm writing a letter to Deb, it's dear Deb. I would write, a greeting and then the purpose of the letter and then the body of the letter. I would close the letter. If it was a business letter, I'd have an action I'd want her to take. And then I would maybe close it off with, you know, God's best. A lot of the Bible has patterns like that, but some of them have other patterns. And the one pattern that um, it's kind of poetic, it's called the chiasm. And it's in your, your notes, but what it looks like, it looks kind of like a V. So point one, oh, I got some here, Deb. You can, oh, I don't have any more with me, but you can borrow the ones that I have. There's some more at the house too. So a chiasm looks like, that's okay. I've already done those ones. Now you're caught up. So maybe what I'll do is Addy, if you can maybe hand yours, hand yours up. And share with Marshall for now, unless Marshall doesn't have his. Marshall has his. I'll take I'll take the ones that Dad has. That's right. I need these ones. Yes, enter. Okay, what's well, probably about nine, eight thirty or nine. We'll see how it goes. If you need to duck out, you just duck out. So I'm gonna try even um, sharing street screen on here. Okay, so here we go. This is me playing with a whiteboard. Look at that, Kim, Ted and Ann. I have a whiteboard that I have now that I'm sharing with them. And so what we're doing is we're discussing what a chiasm is. And so it would be like putting point A at the beginning of a poem. Okay, but the very last line of the poem will also be point A. Oh boy, spelling. Yeah, it's, it's funny, yeah, point A. So the next line would be point B, and then point B again. I'm going to go just to make a short one, point C. You can see it's a, a poetic tool. And then the main point is D. So this happens a lot. And you can actually see there is almost like um, arrows pointing to the main point. So if I was writing a poem, it would be the sky is blue, the grass is green, 
The trees are large. The world is wonderful. The trees are large. The grass is green. The sky is blue. So that everything has this balance back and forth, but there's only the main point. Revelation is built that way. The reason I'm bringing this up is because the book of Revelation actually has a pattern like that. I want to switch out of this. Stop sharing. There we go. I'm back. So there's going to be different books of the Bible. And it, it's important to remember that actually every book of the Bible has some sort of pattern and some intention. In the books of the Bible are not random. And you definitely see that with, um, for example, the books of the Bible of um, oh, sorry, the books of the Bible that were written, the Gospels, each one of the Gospels has this, why are they sometimes in different order a bit? Because the author's trying to emphasize something different because it's written to different people. So it's written towards those people that are, Matthew is written to Jewish people, focuses a lot on Jesus as the Messiah. Mark is more written to Gentiles and it's written to show you that Jesus is the son of God. And then you're also looking at, um, so and Luke is written, with acts in mind and it's a, a detailed account for this one guy and then john is all about the conversation because john wants you to decide jesus is the christ so each one is emphasizing different points so we just need to be aware of that and what point is it in revelation what is revelation focusing on and revelation is focusing on if anyone has ears to hear let him hear Whenever you see that in Revelation, you need to stop and pay attention. And we see that we'll see that next week, because next week is the churches. And this phrase is repeated. Remember, repetition is important. We've covered that in church before. We've covered, don't just read one verse at a time. We've covered that in church. Those are Bible study tools. You guys are already up on that. So who's ready to get into chapter one? Okay, I got some smiles out here. I've got some. Okay, this is good. So we are now getting into chapter one. So if you can turn in your Bibles, we're going to ask these actual questions. So the first question we're going to ask is, who is the author? Can we find that out in the first? Normally, you can find it out right away. John, that's right. No, it doesn't say specifically. It doesn't say specifically John the Apostle, but it's understood that it's John the Apostle by most scholars. Some scholars will point out and say that there's there could be more than one John. Most scholars will, will be like, no, it was because you also back it up with church history and who was exiled on the island of Patmos, John the Apostle. So we're going to get into that. So let's just we'll read the first three verses and then we'll just stop and and talk a little bit about John. So the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads this prophet, reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. So here we see um, the reason why I would say it's John. And again, this is me talking. There might be others that would disagree. But he says here that it's the Apostle John because he bore witness of the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus. In other words, he was there 
with Jesus. He's bearing witness that Jesus is who he says he is. That's why I would go with that John. So we're going to kind of aim at that, that it is that John. Not to disagree with the study Bible, but that's just, I'm doing that. I'm, doing, I'm going to disagree with that because I think it is John the Apostle. But that's okay because we find these things. Um, and the reason why, I, I, like I said, is because it says he bore witness of the word of God. There could have been other Johns following Jesus, but nobody as close as John the Apostle. Who was John the Apostle? Though? Who is this John? And what is, what is the time? Who's the author? If it is John the Apostle, this is the guy who witnessed Jesus Christ, right, including the crucifixion. He was there with Mary at the crucifixion. The only disciple we know that was there. Um, he wrote the Gospel of John to help convince others to believe in Jesus Christ. John wrote 1 John, or the elder wrote 1 John, to help Followers of Jesus recognize their walking and experience in life as one of God's people, one of his children. Second John is another book in the New Testament written to encourage another church to keep walking in the truth and love. I'm summarizing all John's books in one line each. Mind you, third John and second John are short anyways. Third John was written to encourage another church leader and possibly one of his disciples named Gaius. Um, imitate what is good instead of practicing what is evil. That's the heart of that one. Um, overall, in the event that John wrote all these books of the Bible, so the, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation, that's all the same guy. It's 20%, over 20% of the New Testament. There's only two authors that have written more than New Testament. Anyone have a guess? Paul is one in the New Testament. That's right. Luke and Paul. Luke is actually the most. Unless Paul wrote Hebrews. We're not sure who wrote Hebrews. But if Paul wrote Hebrews, then he gets them by just a little bit. Like a few hundred words. Nobody really knows who wrote Hebrews. Yeah, that's right. We just, we're pretty sure he, he's, he was Hebrew or... You know, that's the joke where someone says it's he either made, made beer or coffee, that's right? Does he bruise? Yeah, that's my that'll be it for today. Um, church history tells us that John's the only apostle to die of natural death, and he was tortured for Christ, exiled on the island of Patmos off present day Turkey, and as a result of his life for his faith for Christ. He was on this island when he receives these visions. And that's where it begins, the book of Revelation. However, John is also known for being in Ephesus. He was a leader in the church of Ephesus, too. So we're going to actually look at that. I've got a map behind me, so we'll see where those places are uh, in just a few minutes. But the opening verses lay down some very important guidelines. Uh, where it says here, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep the things that are written to it for the time is near. That is important. We're just going to keep kind of going back. You know, we're blessed for reading Revelation. We're, we're blessed if we listen to it. So read it out loud to yourself. We're blessed. It just said that. That's exciting. Um. Another um, thing that we should say as well, what does revelation mean? First of all, I want us to be very clear. It's the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. This is not a book revealing the devil. This is not a book about revealing the end times. It's a book about the revelation of Jesus Christ. Deb's disappointed. That's okay. It is Jesus at the end times, though. So, um, but it's the word revelation is the Greek word apocalypsis. In French, how do we say this book, Frank? Apocalypse. The book apocalypse. It's almost the same as the Greek word. Um, and it really, uh, the best explanation 
Uh, one of the references you'll see is that Pastor Jake who visited here from Vineland. He has a study on it. Revelation, he goes way more in depth than we will go into. But he says, word apocalypsis is very much like pulling back a curtain to reveal what's behind the curtain. And it's not a little man controlling all kinds of things like in the Wizard of Oz. It's God is pulling back a curtain so we can see something. Specifically, so these people can see something. So who are these people? So even, even sometimes it's just as important to know who the audience is as it does who the author is. Even the book of Hebrews, makes it makes no sense unless you know what a Hebrew is. That one's very important. We don't even need to know the author of that one. We need to know who it's written to. Another word that's important in the first passage is the word uh, keep. In some Bibles, it's the word heed. Others, it's the Bible. It's the word to obey. Uh, the Greek word is tere, tereo. Something like that. It's kind of translated to observe, like like <clears throat> observing the commandments. So uh, it's like observing the teachings of Jesus or to guard, to hold on to something so that you won't allow it to escape. You watch something so close that you don't want to let it escape. So that was my first career. I was a guard, security guard. So there we go. I have to go back to that. So it's not just blessed he who, who he who reads and hears the words and thinks about them. We need to take action. We need to obey the words that are, are given to us. Guard them. So the intended audience. For this, there's a, a map that is in the notes. Um, I have a map behind me. I'll do my best to show where everything is. I'm not going to share a screen on that one. Same map. Same map that you guys have, almost. <clears throat> I'm going to keep reading. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. <coughs> Excuse me. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and made us kings and priests to his God and father, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. So this is that. Remember, we were talking about how a letter, often Greek letters, they had this greeting and a prayer. So I'm going to tell you who it's written to, and then I'm going to pray for them. Here's that prayer. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Um, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. So he's just going to keep talking. All this whole, this whole paragraph that we have as a paragraph is about Jesus, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over all kings of the earth, him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Jesus makes us kings and high priests. Well, not high priests. He's the high priest. We get to be priests, little priests. To his God and our Father, his Father, to him be glory forever and ever. And that is one of the themes of this book. We're going to see that over and over again, where Jesus is high and lifted up. He is the ruler. He's the exalted one. A lot of people spend a lot of time in Revelation trying to figure out who the beast symbolizes and all the bad stuff that goes on. Yet when we read Revelation, the person that actually stands out the most is Jesus. So when I'm reading this book, I see it as a revelation of Jesus. Yeah, do I want to know all the details? I'm actually okay with not knowing details. It says, continues on, it's still talking about Jesus. Behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. They who have pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Amen. Then Jesus speaks. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Still talking about Jesus is involved in this. 
Now, if you have a red letter Bible like mine, I know it's Jesus talking because the letters are in red. Um, if you don't, no worries. You don't have to have a red letter Bible. You can figure out when it's Jesus speaking. And here's where the vision comes. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation of the kingdom and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God, for the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters in the Greek alphabet. We didn't take the time to know that. We'd be like, I am the A to Z. Let's be Canadian. Gabe said the A to Z. I'm going to put it Canadian. Or the A to Z. And he says, write what you see in this book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So who are these churches? What do we have? Well, I'm going to just walk to the map um, so we can all look together. Here's an old map. This section here is all of Asia right here. It's not Asia like we think Asia. It's not the continent of Asia. It's Asia Minor right here. The main city we're looking at is Ephesus. We'll find out that's the biggest one. Really important. Way off the coast here is this little rock called Patmos. You don't even have it on your maps. It's so small. Very little. Only political prisoners went there. It's meant for solitary confinement. It's kind of like what they did to Napoleon. And then you can see here's this really neat trade route. So you come into Ephesus or you come into Smyrna, and there's a road that goes all the way around like this. And it's on a major trade route. And from this city, you can go north, east, south, you go to any which direction you want. So we have Smyrna here. Ephesus is on the coast, Smyrna is on the coast, and then you make this line, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. There's a couple cities that I have on my own map, but that's just, that's for tomorrow or next week. So let's put that into Highway 11 perspective. Okay. As these happened after Christ. So these are all in Greece. And you can actually find out when Ephesus starts because it's in the book of Acts. The book of Acts, start, Ephesus starts with 12 believers. Paul would have visited all these cities. And if he hadn't visited them all, he would have known Christians that were there. So to put it in, in kind of our own geography, you have Mattawa, and then you would have North Bay, right? So that's one part of the lake. And then you, let's say you go south, you're going to stop by in Calendar. You're going to stop by in Bracebridge. You're going to stop by in Huntsville. All these towns along this main highway, that's what we're looking at. This is an easy, it's, it's almost like it's already on the postal route. Which in our township is, you just give it to Lisa and she delivers it for you. So these towns are all like that. They're all the larger towns. Uh, other towns that are in this area are Colossae and Hierapolis. Again, we'll hear about those later. But these are seven day churches. And it's if you wanna know, well, where is that today? If I want to look on a map, can I go visit these places? Only one of them still has kind of a city that's there. Most of them don't. I think Thyatira is the one I read about today. Most of them don't still have. Uh, in fact, Ephesus has pretty much disappeared because, unfortunately, it's a great place on the coast, but there's lots of silt. And because there's lots of silt, the city wasn't a port anymore. <coughs> Excuse me. The land built up where the port was. So where Ephesus is now is about six kilometers inland or something like that. Um, 
Drive Through History, I think, has an episode out of Ephesus. Uh, Frank watches a lot of watched. I think he watched that series two or three times. Oh yeah. Which is another a fun resource where you get to see a guy drive his little Fiat all throughout the Bible type territories. That's so cool. So this is right in the middle of the Roman Empire, by the way. So it's modern day Turkey. If you want to look it up and go, okay, can I go visit? You, if you wanted to go visit these sites, you have to go to Turkey. That's where it is today. Uh, so we get the idea. Some people get the idea of Asia, and it's not. I know I would first time I read it, I was like Asia. I was thinking that's China, yeah. but it's not. They're all Greek cities. They're all in the straight line. Uh, we're in this nice neat pattern. And if John John has this vision on Patmos, then he would return home to Ephesus. He could write it down and send it to all these churches really quick. Most likely that's what happened. So we'll just keep reading a little bit because now it's going to get, sounds a little bit weird. He either wrote it on the island or he wrote it when he got home. Eventually he would have to leave the island because they would have had it. His time would have been served. That's okay. It's a good question. <laughs> Anyone on Zoom, do you guys have any questions? You can also type them into the chat anytime. There's a little button on the bottom that says chat, and you can just type in questions and they'll pop up. So I will just type my question. I didn't, I just typed a comment saying hello. So we're going to keep going on, and it says, What happens when the voice he turns in verse 12? I turned to see a voice that spoke to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with garments down to his feet and girded his chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass that were fine in a furnace, and his voice was as a sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell down at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said to me, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm him who lives and was dead. Behold, I live forevermore. Amen. And I have, I have the keys of Hades and death. Write these things that you have seen and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands, which you saw, are the seven churches. One number that you're going to find out, there's lots of repetition of the number, seven. Lots of sevens. In fact, when you ever see a new seven in the book of Revelation, stop and go, okay, what is this? Am I repeating something, or is this referring to... Because a lot of times the sevens are actually a repetition of the same thing. That's part of the pattern. In fact, I would I like to compare Revelation to a roller coaster. Because there's ups where we go up to heaven and we get to see what's happening in heaven. And then there's downs, we get to see what's going on on earth. And then we have loops because we're doing the same thing over again, just from a slightly different angle. That's one of the patterns that you can see kind of in Revelation. Or that many people see. Which I would I would kind of agree with. So he's saying here, this is Jesus, and I'm come to let you know about these seven. This is a message for these seven churches. And in chapters two and three, there's specific messages to the seven churches individually. And we're going to find out, wow, these are actually really specific messages. And we might try and apply them, but until we know what it meant to them, it doesn't have that same name, same oomph to it. So we're also going to find out different phrases. Next week, we're going to cover different terms, different phrases that we're going to see show up in these messages to these people. Revelation has no real direct quotes, maybe one direct quote from the Old Testament. But the Revelation is full of imagery 
from the Old Testament. You'll see stuff from Ezekiel. You'll see stuff from Daniel. You'll see stuff like, oh, I know I read that the other day in the other part of the Bible. Yeah, you did. You'll see the book of Genesis referenced, yet not a quote. You know how we read the, the book of, of Matthew? We see Jesus quote verbatim the Old Testament. And a lot of times when they quote the Old Testament, they're actually quoting the Greek version of the Old Testament in our Bibles because not everybody understood Hebrew that got these Bibles. So they would use the, the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament. And so that's why it might be a little different. Well, why is it Jesus is quoting something and it doesn't read the same in the Old Testament? Because there's a language shift there. But it's... Um, it's important to note all of the all of these things are referencing back somewhere else. Um, so we'll have to examine that when we get to some of these images. The only image we need to know now, whenever Jesus is talking about these seven lampstands, he's talking about seven churches. So that would be like, let's use the five evangelical missionary churches in this area. There's five of them. So let's say we have those five lampstands. So there's a lampstand for all Calendar Bay. There's a lampstand for South Shore, lampstand for us, lampstand for Lakeshore, and the lampstand for the one in South River. What are the stars then? The angels. Does that mean we have an angel for Heart Church? That's both, that would both be kind of cool and freaky at the same time, because anyone that's ever really read about angels and the big, powerful angels there are, they're scary to a certain level. I'm glad they're on my side. Um, but angel also the word an angel or angelos can mean messenger who is the messenger in Eau Claire that would be me who is the messenger that is in um, Lakeshore Pastor Justin Pastor Simon so he's got he's walking amongst these these golden lampstands so he's amongst the churches Jesus is doing all kinds of work in the churches and then he's got these guys in his hand. So he knows what the, each pastor is up to. He knows these pastors are. So it's important as we just kind of spend a little bit, we're spending actually the most time of any chapter in the Bible in chapter one. So we had to do the introduction too. And, um, so the seven stars. So when we go through chap chapters two and three, so when you're studying at home and you go through, you go, okay, chapters two and three, if you see a reference to a star or a lampstand, just realize it. he just mentioned that. That's why chapter and verse sometimes throws us off. So that's like, oh, so he says, if I'm going to take away your lampstand, what would that mean? He's going to take away the church. And we'll see that next week as, as we get into some of those things. I know it's, yes, hand up, Abby. So Addie was mentioning she likes how both lampstands and stars refer to light. As the church, we are supposed to be the light in the world. That's right. Yeah. Is there anything else that stands out from this? Because this is also, it's always an observer. Anytime we're in a time where we're studying the Bible together, if you have an observation, put your hand up and go, oh, oh, oh. I saw something. Well, you'll see that there's each one of these churches has certain good things going for them. Some of them have bad things going for them. And God is trying to encourage them. Well, you could... You could, you could probably. Now, some people think that they're like seven stereotypical churches. Yeah. But they're not. They could be, but specifically look at each individual church as to who it was written first. And then go, oh, yeah, I could see how we could struggle with the same thing. So God could be speaking for us or speaking to us that, okay, we need to, we need to pay attention to what that message was because we look a lot like that church.
right now it's just really exciting to see at the beginning of Revelation how how glorious Jesus is. In most of the first chapter, it's how glorious he is. Even the point where he says, I turned and to him who spoke with me. And he saw the lampstands and he sees the seven stars. But it's this picture of Jesus where he is so bright. His hair is white, like brilliantly shining. And I know that's not necessarily, we see every picture of Jesus, he doesn't have light hair, it's dark hair, but this is Jesus in his glory. That John catches this glimpse up and it's like, oh, so much so he faints. Marshall's Bible app just opened up at random. So. We all were like, what? That's a good verse, but um, like the, all the different pictures of, of purity, white also speaks of purity. Um, even the fact that his feet were like fine brass, refined in a furnace. Now that's going to speak to one of the specific churches. The wool that's pure is going to speak to some of those churches. Why? Because they produced some of those things. That, so that's that's speaking to every one of them. Um, he's got a garment down to his feet and he's girded about the chest with a golden band. Now I can't picture all of this. Mine, mine says sash. A golden sash, kind of like I don't know if it's going this way or going across the middle, like a cummerbund. Normally a sash goes this way, Frank's saying, yeah. So like from a shoulder to a hip. The only time I've ever seen sashes really used is Miss this Miss America, maybe the Queen. The Queen has one, yeah. Queen Queen Elizabeth. Queen Victoria would have had one possibly too. Yeah. Boy Scouts wear sashes, yeah. Right, so we see here, it just as we're observing it, and this is a good way to observe. The idea is, is we look at this, and I can make maybe 20 observations. We've already made 20 observations. Well, we could go back tomorrow and make 20 more, and make 20 more. We'll never really get all the way through it. So it's good to just keep making these observations, but especially what is it leading us to? And really, if we want to finish with an action, and hey, we're only an hour, that's good. I don't know how it's going to be, what the lengths of these are going to be, but this is good. What is the action that we need to take in this? And I think the action is probably going to go to verse three. Blessed is the one who reads and those who hear and those who take heed or keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. And there's some points in these in the book of Revelation, it's already happened. Because these churches don't exist anymore in Greece anymore. Or in Turkey. They, well, the, the, especially the parts representing the original seven churches. Those seven churches aren't here anymore. There's been a lot of church history since then. The middle is going to be interesting. Like, like I said, there's parts where we're going to be on earth and then we're starting here on earth. And then we get this, this kind of this glimpse of Jesus. It's like, we're going up the roller coaster at the park and you're at the very beginning and it's all slow. So we go slow at this point. And then it's going to go rapidly downhill as we see these different churches. And then we're going to get a glimpse of heaven in chapters four and five. And then it's going to kind of crescendo. And then we're going to see stuff happen. And it's going to go almost like in a circle. So you're like, this is on earth and in heaven. What's going on? And then it's going to go back up again. And then we're going to see another circle. Where it's like, what's going on earth? And then it's back to down below again. And then there's another seven. What is going on? And then it's going to do it. There's going to be a bit of a break in the middle. And again, we're going to go through. And every time we go through one of those loops, you know what it's like when you see something and then you go back and look at it again. And you see more. 
And then you look at it again and you see more. And then you look at it another time and you see even more. It's almost like those, those sevens that we'll see later on. It's like the same set of uh, circumstances, but you're gonna see them zoomed in every time. Of course, the picture I thought of immediately when I thought of zoom in was video games where you've got the sniper rifle and you zoom in and then you click again and you can zoom in even farther. That's a good example of what we're doing when we zoom in later on in those, those wheels. But for today, um, we've covered a good foundation, a good start. Now, is there any questions? There's seven branches on this map. Yeah. It does remind you very much of the menorah, right? Hey, Kim. Head man. Menorah is like one of those lampstands you see at Hanukkah. But they would have been the same kind of candle that they would have used and lamp they would have used um, in the temple and in the tabernacle. Because there always had to be light in the tabernacle. They would have been burning all of oil. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. So Deb was saying it reminds her of the song from Mercy Me. I can only imagine where I can only imagine being in Jesus' presence. Will we fall at Jesus' feet when we're in his presence? I would say yes. I've seen I've seen some pictures. Some people, when they think of heaven, we think of the people that we've lost, and that's the first person you'll greet. I don't think so. I think we'll be falling at our feet at Jesus. Just, just com comprehending this being, this God, he came like me and died in my place. He became, to use Gabe's word, the propitiation, the perfect sacrifice. We will have a redeemed body. So when everything gets made new at the end of Revelation, we'll see it. Our bodies will be transformed. So we will be like Jesus because Jesus has a body. So our body is going to be like Jesus. And Jesus' body, he ate. He ate fish and honey. So I'm, I'm hopeful for at least the honey part. And the sweet tea. <laughs> right? Absolutely. A new eye, new, you know, all kinds of different things. And that's something to look forward to. And there is an element of revelation that is about looking forward to. Um. Yes, he fainted. Yeah, it's like yeah. he fainted. <laughs> Almost. We might. Also, the main, we're going to see a main theme come up. And um, I wasn't planning it, but if we can just turn over to Revelation chapter 13. I want us to, I want us to observe for this. Because Revelation chapter 13 and actually, uh, we'll also look at chapter 12. There's two verses in here that this is the real theme of Revelation. And this is the point to the arrow, because you're probably going, well, if Revelation is built like an arrow, what is it really pointing to? Well, I might as well. It's not a spoiler alert. I'm not going to make everyone like, who wants to know what it's about now? I, I, okay, good. Um, so what is it about? Revelation chapter 13 and verse 9. Anyone has an ear, let him hear. This is the only time we see it in the middle of the, the, the revelation, by the way. Anyone that has ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Now, it doesn't exactly read clearly on this one, but it's basically saying, those of you who are going to go to prison, you're going to prison. Those of you that are going to die, you're going to die. Persevere anyways. 
because that's what we do as God saves. And it sounds like this in Revelation chapter 12. We just look on the other page. And 12 verse 11. It says they overcame him being the devil by the blood of the lamb and their word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives unto death. The point of revelation is to stick with Jesus and endure, even if we have to face death. God wins, because that's a huge part of Revelation 2. God wins, and we want to join him in that victory, but we have to stay with him and endure. So the message we're going to hear over and over again is this, stick with him and endure. The devil is defeated. Chapter 12, when we get to chapter 12 and 13, the devil just gets trounced over and over again. And you don't hear about that when a lot of people are teaching on Revelation from the other point of view, where we're, we're, we're like, oh, where's, what's going on in the world? And we're looking at it from our point of view. And it's so much nicer to realize that these people were being encouraged to endure and stay faithful all the way to the end. And they didn't, some of these, some of these cities, they had it easy. Some of them didn't. But. That's the message of Revelation. Jesus is trying to encourage us. The action that we can take is to endure. It's revealing. It's pulling the curtain back. It's revealing Jesus. But it's revealing Jesus so that we have something to look forward to. So we can endure. It's like seeing the finish line. And I, I'll finish with the story of uh, a friend of mine. He was a, a runner. And he was running training for the Olympics. He was that good. And in his last race before the Olympics, there was a turn in the last 500 meters. And being a marathon runner, he's tired. He's exhausted and he's wiped. And he couldn't see the finish line, so he didn't quite know how far it was. So he stopped running. And that distance where he decided to walk to the finish line is what cost him going to the Olympics. We get to see the finish line. We get to see the finish line. It's Jesus. So we get to keep our eyes focused and fixed on him. So let's pray. Lord, as we spend time in Revelation, I just pray that each one of us will get a new glimpse of who you are and how good you are. And at the same time, that we would be encouraged to endure, to be faithful, not get caught up in all the different issues that are, are mentioned in it, but be faithful and true because that's the people you highlight jesus is highlighted through this entire book and so are his faithful people so help us to see it help us to encourage others and just trust you you've got it and that we know we know that when we look to that finish line you are there and whether we faint because you're so awesome or we just bow down or we give you a hug we thank you lord that you are the finish line. Amen. Okay, I'm excited for next week. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to find out what kind of uh, what kind of church is there. Actually, I because I've been studying it the past few days, I actually feel a connection now with these other churches. Even though they're already in glory, they're in heaven, I feel connected to them. Because you know what? We're connected to the church historically, and we're connected to the church around the world. 